Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in God's house today. We welcome every one of you. We welcome any visitor that might be visiting with us today. We appreciate you being here in the house of the Lord. Beautiful day, I think. I appreciate the cold weather myself. We need it. And uh, I appreciate it. I know we have a lot of people that's uh, sick with colds today and some that's able to be here because of um, colds and illness, but I'm glad you're here. And may God bless you. Now, you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. I'm hoping during this hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to hundreds and thousands out in the radio listening audience as well as the ones here in the auditorium of the church. So we appreciate you tuning in. Now, we're moving toward the end of this year. And soon be history. The Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind and press forward to things that are ahead. There's nothing you can do about the past. This year soon be gone. You can't go back and relive it. The Bible said there's not a just person on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All of God's people sometime or another have made mistakes. And when you make a mistake, you shouldn't just stay in the mud hole like a pig. You need to get out like a sheep clean yourself up and move on for God. The devil would like for you to wall in the mud hole because you slipped in and made a mistake and fell in the mud hole. Now don't do that. God's people, many times they do make mistakes. They shouldn't, but they do. And through their mistakes, they should use them as stepping stones not to make the same ones again and forget about them and cast them behind your back. Ask God's forgiveness and when God forgives you, then God cleans the slate God doesn't hold it against you, neither should you hold it against your fellow man if he's mistreated you or done you wrong or you've done somebody wrong or mistakes you made. Ask God to clean your record and turn by the help and grace of God you're going to be a stronger Christian and move on for the Lord. Good as the devil wants is for somebody to wall in the mud. I know some fellas, I know somebody ought to be in the house of God today that... Uh, uh, maybe this hit the bottle. Maybe one time or another uh, used to be enslaved by alcohol and then the devil tricked them and they hit the bottle again and seemed like hard for them to get over it. And I may be speaking to some of you out in the radio listen audience. Uh, you've taken another drink of booze and of course you feel like, well, I've played the devil now. I might as well to give up. No, ask God to help you. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to give you grace and Put it behind you and determine by the help of the Lord that you're not going to do that again. As good as the devil wants to get you to slip up and make a mistake or fall in the mud hole or stand in water like a hog when you need to get out, clean up, and go on for God. You can take an old hog and throw him in a mud hole. He enjoys that. He'll stay there. And all you get out of him is a good grunt of satisfaction. But you take a cat and let that cat fall in that mud hole and move on for him. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 2 today, page 1073. While you're turning there, I want to say something about something that greatly disturbed me that happened last week. You recall down here in southwest Georgia how 12 years ago, some cold, bloody, brutal, bloodthirsty, demon-possessed criminals went into a trailer down there and killed uh, six people out of the all-day family. The all day family were a group of Christian people that loved the Lord. You remember the story. They came in one at a time and they killed those men. One man said to the leader of the group, he said, I, I know you're going to take my life, but my wife will be in short. Please don't harm her. Please don't harm her. And so they killed all the men and they were piled up there in the trailer. And then the wife came in. There's four of these fellows. And they raped her. All of them did, according to the story. They abused her very brutally. And then they carried her off into Apache Woods a little later. And they all raped her again. And she passed out and they just killed her. There they killed six members of this family. Good Christian people. And it stirred that community. It stirred everybody. The most brutal crime ever committed in the state of Georgia. That I can recall. Even in the nation. And there the people considered going and taking these fellows out of jail. And lynching them. But they said, no, we'll let the law take care of them, and we'll abide by the law. 
And so they did that, and now the law has let them down. Some uh, Supreme, some judges, appeal court judges, probably liberals, probably infidels, now have turned over that conviction of the death penalty. That's one of the most low-down, dirty things I've ever heard of a bunch of crooked judges doing. If you don't like it, you can love it, leave it, leave it, or whatever you want to do about it. I'm, I'm disturbed about this thing. The situation of our judicial uh, criminal system today is so rotten that make a buzz regurgitate, and something ought to be done about it, and our politicians and men in authority ought to do something about this. They should have put those men to death within a matter of a reasonable length of time, in a matter of weeks, or maybe months, put them to death. But instead of doing that, we have fed them. The taxpayers have paid their expense and fed those bloody, cold-blooded criminals they have never shown any remorse. In fact, one of them almost escaped again some time ago, according to the paper. And they all broke out of prison in Maryland before they came down and killed a young man just before they left Maryland. Now they sat there on death row for 12 years and you helped pay their expense. The taxpayers in Georgia had to foot that bill because the sorry, rotten, corrupt uh, uh, civil court criminal justice we have today and the criminal justice system we have in America. It stinks to high heaven. Something has got to be done about it. Those three judges should be removed from the bench, have to do it, whether they call it impeachment or whatnot. They should not be allowed to get any retirement fund or whatsoever for even considering or doing a dirty thing like that. If it's anybody in America that should have been put to death, it should have been those people that committed that crime. Now, if they are not put to death, now you listen to this Baptist preacher, if they are not put to death, there's no need of any jury in the state of Georgia ever sending a sentence to anybody else to die in the electric chair. That's the worst crime in the history of Georgia. And if they don't have to pay with their lives, you might well forget about uh, the death sentence. The Bible teaches a death sentence. The Bible plainly said when people take somebody's life, their life is to be taken. That's God's mandate. It's never been changed. It's never been altered. It's all the way through the Bible. Read Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 and many other scriptures. It's all the way through the Bible. Somebody said, well, putting them to death is not going to bring the old day family back. I know that. But putting them to death will do what God said do. It'll help wipe out some of the crime in this nation. And they've been laughing, bragging about killing those people. And one of them, the leader, said they ought to have been killed because they were Christians. And to put people like that to death, you're honoring what the law said, what, what God said in this book. God plainly said that, and it should be done. They should have been put to death in a matter of weeks. But this system we have today is kept on death row for 12 years. That's unreasonable. That's a disgrace to our judicial system in the state of Georgia and elsewhere. Now, I, I'm disturbed about it. Something needs to be done about it. Every time a politician comes around you talk about wanting your vote, you ask him point blank, what are you going to do about the crime in America? Our people in, in leadership, they ought to be doing something about this very thing, about the crime in America. Not only that, I heard some little uh, uh, jerk of a lawyer here in Athens uh, saying that he agreed with what they done. That made me bow my head in shame to know we have a so-called lawyer in Athens, Georgia, that agrees with what those judges did. I'm ashamed that he lives in Athens. I really am. That's the crime of the center. That's the crime of the state of Georgia. That's the most brutal crime I've ever heard of in the state of Georgia. And those people deserve to die. God said they deserve to die and they should be put to death. And people need to get stirred up and do something about it. Everything in your strength and power you can do about it, you ought to do about it. And I contend those three appeal court judges ought to be removed from the bench. They should be. They should be. Beloved, I'll tell you, we need to rise up and, and do what needs to be done about these things the best we know how. And I intend to speak out against this evil as long as God lets me have breath to do so. Now, I want to get that off of my chest today, whether you like it or not. You'll have to admit I'm telling you the truth. And these little uh, medium-out liberals today that's against capital punishment... They're against God, they're against the Bible, they're against common decency, and the American Crank and Lunatic Union is against the Bible, they're against common decency, they're against the law of God, 
and they're against the law abiding citizen in America. Whether you believe that or not, we got to get back to some common sense, get back to this Bible. Uh, we don't have long to live in America as Americans as we once knew it. It'll be dangerous to walk down the street if something's not done in the future. Now you keep that in mind. Now in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, the same man was Jason devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came by the Spirit of the temple, and when the parents brought the child uh, Jesus to do for him after custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared for the face of all the people, a light to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rise again of many in Israel, and for a sign shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce thine own heart also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I want to speak to you in the next few minutes on the first coming of our dear Lord. All through the Old Testament you find Bible, the Bible scriptures telling us the coming of our Lord, the, about the coming the first time. Now we preach a lot about the second coming of Jesus. I like to do that. It's meet in due season. But at this particular time of the year, I'd like to refresh your minds pertaining to the first coming of our dear Lord. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. See, in fullness of time, on scheduled time, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. Now the Bible tells us so, and I'm going to speak on prophecy pertaining to the first coming of Christ. Now this tape is tape 207, if you're interested in the tape. Now let's move back to the first promise of the coming of Jesus Christ when He came the first time. Now in a little over a week from now, we'll be celebrating the birth of our dear Lord. We don't know the exact day that he was born, whether it was on the 25th or 26th or whether it was in December. We don't know the exact date, but at this particular time of the year, we, we are not uh, worshiping a date. We're not making much over a date. We're talking about the birth of Jesus, regardless of what time he was born or when he was born. Now in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden, and there the devil sneaked in and deceived them. And there we find that Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. And she in turn gave to Adam and he ate also. And then the devil of course caused them to do that. And God came into the garden. And immediately Adam blamed it on his wife. And his wife blamed it on the serpent. Now God is talking to the serpent. Now in those days the serpent walked upright no doubt. And was a very beautiful creature. But when he deceived Adam and Eve. God put him on his belly and said, you'll crawl on the belly the rest of your days and you'll eat the dust to the earth. God put a curse on that serpent. That curse is there and it'll remain there on that serpent. Every time you see a snake crawling on his belly, you remember God put that on him as a curse. He eats the dust to the ground as he crawls on the ground. In other words, uh, the dust he stirs up, he should eat it. And so God said, you eat the dust to the earth. And God made a promise here pertaining to the first coming of Jesus in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now the Bible tells us that God took skins and clothed Adam and Eve after they were found naked. Now the Bible doesn't say God killed an animal, but it implies he did. God could have created those skins, but personally I believe God killed an animal and took the animal's skins. He took skins and made Adam and Eve some clothes out of those skins. And then in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now here we have, have God talking to the serpent. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now here he's talking about the coming Messiah when Jesus would come the first time. He's telling this serpent that he's coming. And he said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. Not man's seed, her seed. See, Jesus was virgin born of a woman. She knew not a man. She was overpowered by the Holy Spirit. She was conceived uh, by the Spirit of God. And there she gave birth to the Son of God without having known man. Mary was just as much a virgin after Christ was born as she was before Jesus was born. You must keep that in mind. 
Now he said here, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that took place on the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, he bruised the head of the serpent. He defeated once and forever the serpent. The devil is a defeated foe. He knows that. He's a usurper. He knows his time is soon coming when he'll be put in the lake of fire. He knows that because Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection bruised the head of the serpent. And what he was doing that the serpent bruised his heel on Calvary. Now Satan tried his best to destroy Jesus Christ before he was ever born into the world. He almost warped out the bloodline and his one little child that was hid away for a number of years and saved the bloodline. Now the devil tried to warp out the bloodline through which Jesus would come, but God uh, protected the bloodline and Jesus came exactly through the bloodline that God said he would come and he was born in due time in fullness of time he was born of a woman. Now in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, God told Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee and these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now what is he talking about? He's, he's telling Abraham here that all the families will be blessed through him upon the earth. That is through, through, through Abraham's seed. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There you have the coming of Jesus Christ implied. That is, he said, you're going to be blessed. The people of the earth will be blessed through your descendants. In other words, God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to send someone through your descendants that will bless the entire earth. In fullness of time, that happened. In fullness of time, Jesus was born. And there that scripture was fulfilled. We find in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 8, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. You know the story here of Isaac and uh, uh, there his father Abraham going up on top of Mount Moriah, going there to make a sacrifice unto God. God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son of promise, Isaac on Mount Moriah, and sacrifice him. When they arrived on the scene, Isaac said, Father, you have the wood and so forth, but where is the sacrifice? Uh, he said, God provide himself a lamb. Provide himself a lamb. That is God, Jesus Christ, would become the lamb. And there you have prophecy pertaining to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him at the river of Jordan, John said, Behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So here God said, I provide myself a lamb. And he was that lamb. Jesus Christ was that lamb. This is scripture pertaining to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now we find in Numbers chapter 24 verse 17. We find here a prophet uh, giving forth a prophecy. The Bible says I shall see him but not now. I shall behold him but, but, but not nigh. That shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. There you have this prophet giving forth this prophecy that a star would come out of Jacob. Now that star came out of Jacob. You remember when Jesus was born, there they saw the star in the east and the wise men came to worship Jesus from the east. They saw his star. That star was born uh, there in a cow stall and placed in a manger, the Bible tells us. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, it says here, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. Now Moses said, God is going to raise up a prophet like unto me. That prophet was none other than Jesus Christ. That's prophecy pertaining to the first coming of Jesus Christ. And it happened like God said it would happen on scheduled time. Between the book of Malachi and Matthew, there were no prophets in Israel. 400 years of silence. Then John the Baptist came on the scene. Then Jesus came on the scene. And he was that prophet that God told Moses about in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. Now there's a very important verse of scripture I want you to underscore. If you don't have it underscored already. I want you to find it in your Bible in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Over in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7. You will find there a very important verse of scripture. I want you to take a look at it because it is so important. And especially at this time of the year, you need to be reminded of this because the enemy, the devil, like to come in and, and try to destroy and tear down the deity of Christ and deny 
the virgin birth of the Son of God. It's page 719. And Isaiah gave this prophecy, prophecy 742 years before it was fulfilled. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now look at that with you. Isaiah 7 14. If you don't have that, underscore it in your Bible. You ought to take your pencil and underscore that scripture. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin shall conceive. Didn't say a young woman like the moderns and infidels and the modern translators try to place in the new Bibles as they're printing up. Beloved, it said, a young virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That word Emmanuel means God with us. Now, in other words, when Jesus was born, he was God in the manger. He was God that had come down from heaven to be with us. And he came born of a virgin to be with us. And many a hundred years, 725 years before that birth took place, Isaiah the prophet said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now when he made that statement to young maidens in Israel, many of them looked forward to being that woman through which God would use to put Jesus on the earth. You remember John chapter 4 when he talked to the woman at the well, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman? She said, we know when the Messiah comes, he'll do thus and thus. Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. Now he came, born of that virgin, exactly like God said he would come, born of a virgin. If you have one of these rotten translations, the Living Bible, or the Good News for Modern Man, uh, the RSV, uh, the Interpreter's Bible, the New English Translation. If you have any of these modern translations and you turn to Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and it says that a young woman shall conceive and the word virgin is left out, just pitch that book over will you please into the fire somewhere. Just get rid of it. It's a modern translation. It's not fit to be called your Bible. And get your good old King James Version Bible. And I recommend the Schofield Reference Bible, the old Schofield, not the new. The old Schofield Reference Bible. Get your good old Schofield Reference Bible. It hasn't been tampered with. It's a Bible God used to produce revivals in this nation. It's a Bible God used to save your forefathers. It's a Bible God used to found this nation on. And it's a Bible of stand uh, when the heavens pass away. Now get your good King James Version. God used that to save nations and the found nations and to give revivals to save multitudes and don't have anything to do with these modern translations. They are translating these Bibles today, modern translations, for one reason as far as they are concerned, and that's to make money. But the main reason is the devil is behind it and he wants to try to corrupt the Word of God. Now I want you to turn, will you please, to Isaiah chapter 9. You've turned to Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9 and let me point out some scripture here pertaining to the first coming of our dear Lord. It's page 721. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That's talking about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That's prophecy 740 years before it came to pass. Unto us a child is born. That child of course is Jesus. Unto us a son is given. God gave His only begotten Son. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. His Son was given. A child was born. A son was given. And the government shall be upon His shoulder. That is yet in the future. That's to be fulfilled later. The government shall be upon His shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment, with justice and forth, but evermore even the zeal of the Lord perform this. Now that is yet to be fulfilled. The only portion that has been fulfilled so far is for unto us a child is born and a son is given. That has already, really literally, minutely been fulfilled when he came the first time. The remainder of those two verses will yet be fulfilled in the scriptures. And so you have prophecy there pertaining to the first coming of our dear Lord. Now let me give you another verse of scripture found in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. 
Not only does the Bible tell us Jesus would come the first time, but he told us exactly where he'd be born. Now there were two Bethlehems in the Bible. There's one in the north and one there at, at Euphrates. And there's two of them. So God had to mark out the one which one he, that you'd know that Jesus would be born in. The Bible says, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But thou Bethlehem Euphrates, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, get out of thee, shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruling Israel, who's going forth had been from old, from everlasting. Now God said, my Messiah, my son, this babe will be born of a virgin, and he will be born in Bethlehem, Ephratar. Now there was another Bethlehem over in the northern part of Israel. God wanted to be sure that these people knew which one of the little cities that he'd be born in. And he was born in the Ephratar, a little city just out of Jerusalem, a very beautiful, clean little city. One of the oldest churches in the world is built there over the mansion where Jesus was born. I've been there a dozen times, and uh, it's a very beautiful place. I always love to go there. I've been in the stable where he was born. I've been out in the shepherd fields where the shepherds were when they uh, were told that he'd been born. And uh, I'll tell you, it's fascinating. It's heart-stirring just to be in those places. And he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is one of the most beautiful little cities uh, near Jerusalem. Now you must keep that in mind. Now if you want to go to uh, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, reading from Matthew verse 16 through 25, and Luke chapter 1 verses 26 through 8 through 38, you can find the story of how Jesus came and what happened. The angel appeared unto Mary and told her that she would conceive and bring forth a son. And she couldn't understand how. She said, how can I bring forth a child having never known man? She is a young virgin that loved God and had never known man. And the angel said, the power of the Most High shall come upon thee. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. And then that which is born of thee will be the Son of God. And so Jesus, Mary was told exactly how Jesus would be born. And you have the beautiful story in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16 through 25. And Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Very, very beautiful indeed is the story of the birth of Jesus. I like to read it over and over again. I love this time of the year. I love Christmas time. I know, I know a lot of people don't believe in Christmas, but that's their own uh, uh, prerogative. They don't believe in it. That's up to them. I don't celebrate a Christmas tree. I, I don't celebrate a uh, uh, day. At Christmas time, I talk about the birth of our dear Lord. At this particular time of the year, whenever the weather is cold, the leaves are dead, and everything looks dead, there's nothing in America that uplifts America any more than Christmas time. They just get a good uplifting. I know many of them make merchandise of the day. Many of them look forward to it to make money. But beloved, I look forward to it because I believe in the birth of our Lord. And I like to see people joyful. I like to see them uplifted. And at this particular time of year, in the deadness of the year, seem like when everything is kind of dead, then comes Christmas time. And people get jolly and happy and uplifted. And it's a big thrill. It's something to look forward to, to uplift people. And by all means, it ought to be uplifting to the people of God. For this reason, we should think about the birth of our dear Lord. Yes, I know, I know, we don't know the real day, nor the month in which he's born, but we are not celebrating that particular phase of it. The fact of his birth is what we have in mind. There's a verse of scripture too over in Jeremiah, I believe chapter 10, pertaining to a tree that's decorating all that kind of stuff. A lot of people use that to try to say, well, this is a Christmas tree. Well, in those days, they knew nothing about Christmas. Christ had never been born. That was used in respect to heathen worship in those days. And they worshiped those things and worshiped those trees. And they uh, had to do with heathen gods. We are not serving a heathen god. We're serving a true god. And what we do when we light up around Christmas, we want to celebrate the true God, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it should be a day of gladness and rejoicing and a day of praising God because Jesus Christ was born into the world around 2,000 years ago. So you celebrate a person and the fact he was born, not only born, but lived, died, buried, and rose again, and he's coming back again. That's what we need to celebrate around Christmas time. 
Thank you. I've tried to give you some scripture pertaining to the first coming. I only touched on it, but I hope I've said something that puts you studying and thinking as you sojourn. Let us all stand our feet, will you please? Our Father, I pray today that you use the message and that you warm hearts and that you stir souls. And thank you that Jesus was born. And we're celebrating his birthday, the fact that he came down to us. God with us, the Bible tells us. And he came to be with us. And thank you for that fact. In Jesus' lovely name, amen. David's going to play on the uh, organ here, stanza. So if you're here today and you're not saved, are you a backslidden on God? Are you uh, need to come forward, Peter Reeves? Would you come while she plays on the organ for just a stanza? So. God is speaking. Would you come? You need to get saved. Come back to God. Join the church.